Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Sustainable Tourism Toolkit webinar series. My name is Nick Cooper from the Tourism Collective, and it is our pleasure to be delivering this webinar on behalf of the Australian government. The Sustainable Tourism Toolkit is a how-to guide to help Australian tourism businesses become more sustainable. This is webinar two of a four-part webinar series that will share practical inspiration and case studies that bring to life the pillars of the toolkit for tourism businesses of all sizes. Before we keep going through the webinar today, I'd like to um, acknowledge um, the First Nations people of the land that I'm talking from today. I'm based on the Mornington Peninsula, and I acknowledge the Bunurong, Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation who have cared for the waters of la and land um, here for millennia. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and would like to extend those respects to the First Nations country and people from where you are tuning in from today. As I mentioned, my name is Nick Cooper. I'm the Regenerative Tourism Specialist at the Tourism uh, Collective. Um, the Tourism Collective is a small tourism consultancy and we work with destinations and operators all over Australia. Um, my colleague uh, Rebecca White is also here from, from the Tourism Collective, um, so she's also going to be managing the chat today. I'm also a small business owner, so I run a small tourism operator on the Mornington Peninsula called Wild Adventures Melbourne, or WAM. And after spending over two decades working in tourism in many different countries, I saw the impact, both positive and negative, that tourism can have. And so when it came to starting my own business, I really wanted to find solutions to them and be a force for good. So the foundations of WAM have been built to have a positive environmental and social impact infused holistically across the entire business. And I will be sharing examples of that, but I also completely understand the challenges and um, everything it takes to run a small business as well. So I can uh, really relate and hopefully provide some good insights um, and examples uh, too for you. Just some logistics of this webinar is that the, the webinar will be recorded um, for you um, to view afterwards. Beck will be managing the uh, chat box um, for any questions you have, and we will be doing a Q&A at the end, so adding in any questions there, and we'll be hopefully be able to answer some of them as we go through the webinar today. Cool. So let's, uh, this webinar is, is webinar two. Um, and I'm just going to turn off my um, camera so you can concentrate on the slides that are, are taking place. So we did um, webinar one um, on Tuesday and there is a replay available of that. We highly recommend if you haven't seen that already to go back through and look at uh, webinar one because um, it gives some great ideas about taking a managed approach, which is chapter one of the Sustainable Tourism Toolkit. It also talks about making a commitment to sustainability, environmental and social measures to manage your business, developing a sustainability action plan, talks through accreditations and certifications, as well as next steps to take as well. Today is chapter two. We are, we're going to be talking through uh, chapter three uh, on the 9th of May, and then chapter four and five are on the 15th of May. So today's agenda, we're going to do a, a quick recap and an overview of the toolkit. We're going to go through chapter two, which is environmental and climate action, and unpack that a little bit of that, that chapter of the toolkit and what that means. Um, and then also taking action in your destination or business too. Before we go any further, there is a, a Slido poll that we've created on there. So there's a QR code on your screen and you can scan that QR code with your phone and it's gonna ask you a multiple choice question. And that question is how confident do you currently feel in taking environmental and climate action in your business? So if you can scan that QR code, and just answer that multiple choice question, that would be great. And Beck, if you can give me an indication as they come through, that would be wonderful too. Yeah, so they're streaming in, so thank you everyone. So it looks like we've sort of got a slightly confident, is probably where most of the people are sitting, around 40%. Um, and then there's a few somewhat confident, a few fairly confident, but not that many completely confident. So yeah, so thank thank you everyone, and we'll just leave that on there for a few more minutes for another moment, Nick, before you move on. Beautiful, and that's what we find is that this spectrum of um, 
the, the spectrum of confidence um, across these workshops and when we work with destinations and organizations and operators is um, really differs and that's this toolkit has been designed to suit all businesses and all operators whatever stage or level of, of, of sustainability you're on as well so hopefully by the end of this webinar we'll give you some great ideas food for thought and hopefully increase that confidence a bit from there so we're just going to quickly do a, a overview of the toolkit and um, do a little recap of of what it is so the context of the toolkit came out of the framework and thrive 2030 strategy so the national sustainability framework for the visitor economy and the sustainable tourism toolkit is a key deliverable of australia's national tourism strategy thrive 2030 the toolkit is essentially the how the how to implement sustainable practices uh, designed for operators to do so and the sustainable um, toolkit is part of a training activation program to help the industry become more sustainable it's a joint austrade tourism australia and state and territory government organization initiative uh, across all of them the toolkit comes in two versions there's a pdf version which can be downloaded and beck's going to be providing some links to these and there's also an online version as well, which um, again, Beck will provide a link to. So there's two options to go into. The PDF version is a great resource to, to go through and use. And then there's an online version that, that links through to, to various um, other resources to help. So the toolkit comes across five chapters. As I mentioned before, webinar one, which uh, the recording is now available, is taking a managed uh, approach. The second chapter, which we're talking about today, is environmental and climate action. The third chapter, which we'll be speaking at in their third webinar, is respecting culture. And then the fourth and the fifth chapter, creating positive social impact and promoting your sustainability story, takes place in the fourth webinar on the 15th of May. So how to use the toolkit. The toolkit sets out practical advice, guidance and actions your business can take to improve your practices across the four pillars of the sustainability. Use the toolkit as a toolbox almost. So use it going in and out of that to find the tool that you need for your business. So rather than reading cover to cover, using it as a toolkit and, and finding the relevant part that's gonna help that particular aspect of your business as well. So each pillar in, includes a topic introduction, top tips, key terms and links to, to sources. Uh, and also first step actions and next step actions for your business to take. So let's jump into chapter two of the toolkit, environmental and climate action. Key topics that we will explore further today include energy, waste, water minimization tips, being resilient ready, supporting biodiversity and regeneration, interacting with wildlife carefully and shaping visitor behaviors. We will share tips and ideas, including examples of what this looks like for a variety of operators across Australia. So why take environmental and climate action? There's lots of benefits to this, and this includes um, making a head start on the compliance that's becoming ever more pre prevalent for tourism operators and businesses, cost savings over the long term, reputation and customer loyalty, um, and then risk mitigation, becoming a more resilient business because of it. So let's start with reducing your energy consumption, which may seem like a daunting task. However, there are lots of technologies and processes you can make, regardless of your business type, which can all add up to significant savings in your business. Energy reducing tips include some of them on here, such as reviewing your equipment, energy efficient appliances, comparing energy contracts, using and utilizing renewable energy, uh, even temperature settings and timers and educating visitors and staff. There's lots of tips that the toolkit contains. Firstly, before we look at exploring energy reduction tips, let's have a look at the scope one, two and three of emissions. So scope one is your direct emissions, what your business burns. That could be if you were a tour operator, your company owned vehicle. Scope two is your indirect sources. So that could be your electricity. Scope one and two are sometimes the easiest to reduce your emissions or to tackle your emissions of decarbonizing across them. But scope three is everything else. 
And Scope Free has a lot of examples that we've included there, such as your office equipment um, and printing, the products and services your business uses and the emissions associated with them, laundry, sunscreen, water bottles, linen, food, to be your business travel, your water usage, your waste disposal, your visitor emissions, uh, even your employees commuting to your business. So there's a lot of um, scope and this can be one of the most challenging um, areas to reduce your emissions across, but also one of the areas for, for great opportunity to reduce your emissions too. And the toolkit contains some great ideas and tips and tools as well as this webinar today. So as we touched on in module one calculating your carbon emissions is a really important um, tool to start measuring and there are online tools out there these online tools can save you time they can help you um, calculate your your carbon they can provide training uh, on how to cut emissions so there's many to choose from um, some are free some are paid some are online some are in person as well some of the online um, Carbon calculators include action plans, communication templates, local state collectives. So there's there's a lot of uh, choice out there and the toolkit talks through uh, different options. The toolkit also contains uh, an energy tracker on Appendix 1 and that energy tracker can, can help you start filling that out to put down the emissions from your electricity, your gas, your business travel, your water usage and your waste generated. So um, there's a lot of areas to, to cover and a carbon calculator can really help you do that. It's really important too to compare energy contracts. So re reviewing the current energy provider that you've got and seeing whether that's the, the best value option. Is there the opportunity to negotiate a better rate by um, potentially looking elsewhere? Is there a green energy contract that you can use for your business? Um, can you compare and consider alternative suppliers? On the screen there, you've got a Greenpeace produced the Green Electricity Guide, which is an online resource which reviews and rates the different energy providers across Australia. It's also really important to review on an annual basis. So, for example, for my small business, we're using a carbon neutral uh, energy provider who then one year were bought out by um, a huge uh, oil company um, who's one of the world's biggest emitters and um, we decided that we no longer wanted to be with that energy provider so we decided to change so reviewing on an annual basis is really important and there's a link in the toolkit for further assistance on reviewing your energy contract looking at renewable energy and, and looking at those sources whether that's through generating your own electricity with solar panels or with green power agreements through your electricity supplier the toolkit contains links to more information on renewable energy, but on your screen, you can see to Bilk Winery, which is the winery in Victoria. They're a family run business and they've reduced their greenhouse gas footprint by 45%. They've secured a green loan from one of the big four banks to install solar. And that's really helped them flatten out the rising energy costs and also provided them resilience against regional blackouts, which aren't infrequent in uh, regional parts of Australia. So they've really benefited um, from using that renewable energy, um, both from a business perspective and an environmental perspective too. Reviewing your equipment and looking at your equipment across there is another great way of reducing your emissions. So looking at the systems you have in place, such as your air conditioning and your heating, uh, your hot water units, the laundry equipment you use, your cooking appliances, could be if you have a swimming pool, the filters that that's using or the pumps, uh, lighting across your business. Um, Auto Hotel in Melbourne, they have a they use 100% green energy for their, that hotel. 95% of their lighting is energy efficient. Um, and, you know, even their air conditioning that they use has a six star energy rating. So they've looked at all parts of that of their equipment to ensure they're using the most efficient options. They even have an EV for uh, guests to use plus electric vehicle charges, which can be used too. Talking of lighting and shade, upgrading lighting systems to include energy efficient bulbs like LED, um, looking at lighting systems on timers or sensors, making use of that natural light um, across your business, and then even the use of shades. So that could be blinds, curtains, tinting, awning, even native plants to uh, use that, that light and shade from there. So Alex Hotel in Perth in Western Australia, 
has tinting on all their glass windows, which has given them less reliance on heating and cooling systems and therefore less uh, usage of energy. They have no mini bars in their rooms. Instead, uh, they have a communal fridge in public areas to reduce their energy uses. So they've kind of looked at that across different areas and uh, reduce their energy uh, in that way. A key way to reduce energy consumption is to educate staff. So look to train your staff and ensure they're contributing to your energy saving practices, but also uh, communicating that to your visitors and really giving your, your visitors energy saving ideas before and during their visit with you. Transport is one of the largest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. Due to the nature of tourism and the distances people travel to destinations, particularly Australia, transport makes up a large part of the sector's emissions. So what can you do from an operator point of view? You know, uh, encouraging uh, staff and visitors and educating them on uh, ways to travel more efficiently or more environmentally friendly, encouraging cycling or walking or taking public transport, promoting, for example, a shuttle service to the airport with an electric vehicle or hybrid vehicle service could be an option. Hotel Hotel in Canberra, they have a complimentary um, bicycles for their guests to use, but they also back that up with suggested cycling itineraries to really kind of, um, you know, promote the destination in a way that can be cycled easily and encouraging uptake of that. So there's lots of options and it can even include your staff transport of, um, you know, how your staff can get to work through carpooling or public transport and things as well. So there's lots of ways you can tackle that. Electric vehicles, as we know, is um, uh, a, a key one and as infrastructure increases across Australia, it becomes more and more attractive for visitors um, to use. So it, it, it's, can you install a charger at your business and or, or share info of local electric vehicle charging in, in and around your business? That can be a good way to attract that electric vehicle um, traveler who's coming into your region, who knows that there's charges in there because there is range anxiety. Um, which can be a concern for travellers to, you know, not find a charger when they need one. So be accurate with tried and tested routes. Um, if you're going to be renewing your vehicles across your business, do a business case to consider uh, renewing or, or getting a hybrid or an electric vehicle. Coonawarra wine region in South Australia is, it's around four hours drive from both Melbourne and Adelaide. And there's wineries there that have installed EV chargers. So such as Holix Winery and Radis Estate, they've installed uh, chargers there. And that can lead to guests staying longer, um, buying more, strong word of mouth, visiting specifically to charge their, their EV, but then staying for longer and uh, spending time and, and money in, that, in those venues too. There is a lot of discussion about the rights and wrongs of offsetting carbon emissions and the toolkit does speak about all this. I guess um, not all offset programs are equal. So it's really, really important to set targets to decarbonize rather than just offset. Setting longer term goals to decarbonize your business, going beyond carbon neutral to net zero or net positive. So not just offsetting your emissions, but really aiming to decarbonize your business across those scopes one, two, and three. So, and supporting local projects is a really great way um, that you can do as well. So there, there may be a local project to you that you can support of uh, revegetation re projects or planting trees or uh, whatever it may be. And that can be a really nice one to do. So for example, that picture there is um, here on the Mornington Peninsula where there's a, a local, um, reforestation project that we support um, and we sponsor a project uh, a day each year to, to plant lots of uh, trees and grasses and um, shrubs and native shrubs and things as well and um, you know guests really connect with that you know they they connect with that we can see the impact we're having we're showing our get um, our guests on our tours that we're that they're contributing to this so looking to support um, local projects is a great way uh, of um, you know, capturing carbon and um, tackling your emissions in that way too. Managing water usage is a simple way of reducing your environmental impact as well as reducing your costs. There's lots of water reducing tips. And I guess your first 
step is understanding your current total water usage and how it is used. But there's water reducing tips such as collecting uh, rainwater and using grey water, landscaping, um, monitoring water usage, recording and identifying leaks, installing water saving devices, retrofit taps, shower heads and cisterns to more water efficient options, even upgrading, upgrading appliances to water efficient options. There's lots of tips out there and we're going to go through a few examples of what's being done out there. So Tin Dragon Cottages in Tasmania, they actually collect um, all of their the grey water that, those are, that accommodation produces and they recycle it too. United Places, a luxury accommodation in Melbourne, they collect their rainwater, they store it and they harvest it for various different things such as toilet flushing, reducing their water usage by 52%. All of their suites also have solar thermal technology to heat their water significantly significantly reducing their need uh, for gas as well at wham at the business i have we um you know we harness rainwater to clean our vehicle and our equipment too so there's always ways to utilize water collect it and uh, reduce your water usage from there but making water saving fun for your customers can be a much more effective way to reduce water usage from your customers rather than directly telling them what to do so Hunter Water in New South Wales and Bar and Water, they've created a four minute shower playlists on Spotify. So instead of um, you know, saying to your customers, you must only take a certain shower for a certain amount of time, which doesn't have the desired impact quite often. Instead, there's a four minute shower playlist where people can uh, enjoy a shower playlist and um, enjoy that song for example, and uh, reduce their water in that way. So it's just a way of encouraging saving water in the region. A, a playlist on Spotify is a free thing that you could create um, and uh, could be a really fun way of just reducing uh, waste in this. Um, Beck actually, who's on, on this call, she has a teenage son who she wanted to get to reduce water and these four minute shower playlists have been um, an amazing resource to have that. But from a customer point of view, it also works well for your visitor to reduce that. Managing your waste um, is an essential part of your environmental sustainability responsibilities. And there's um, tips include measuring your business waste, reviewing your products and purchasing policies, seeking co-benefits in your purchase, looking at eliminating, reducing, reusing and recycling, tackling your food waste and even good chemical management. So reviewing your current waste um, is a great place to start and measuring your business waste is a really important um, starting point to then aim to reduce that too. So we refer to the uh, appendix one in the toolkit is a really good resource to use, but ask yourself in your businesses, how much is going to landfill, how much is being recycled, how much is being composted, which areas of your business generate the most waste? Moving Feast in Victoria is a collective of social enterprise who have come together and they've even created on their website a step-by-step -step waste audit guide, um, which any business can use to try and measure their waste and then put into place actions to step um, to, to reduce their waste as well. There's also insights and inspiration to reduce waste and increase circularity of items in the waste stream too. So Using the toolkit to measure your waste um, and giving you some ideas from that is a really important step to take. It's also super important to review your products and purchasing policies. So supporting suppliers that design products around whole life cycle environmental costs and seeking co-benefits in your purchases. So you can't always eliminate waste, but look for co-benefits where opportunities arise. For, so for example, finding a paper supplier that donates part of the price to social and environmental causes. Or the example on the screen there is Great Rap, who are um, a Australian uh, based company who create, cre create a cling wrap out of food waste. They turn potato waste into a cling wrap. So if you are a business that uses a lot of cling wrap, for example, you could engage with a, a provider that provides one which is a much better environmental benefit with a compostable cling wrap made of food waste rather than one that was made out of petroleum and is plastic. Looking to eliminate waste is um, 
a great way to do that. And there can be some real low hanging fruit, some real easy ways to do that. So it's it's asking yourself, are some of the products that you use across the business, are they really needed? For example, do you supply plastic bottled water? Um, is there a way to transition away from single use plastic, such as those little shampoo and conditioner bottles or straws or, or plates or cups? Um, having a look at that, Alex Hotel in Perth, who we mentioned before, they simply changed out their plastic water bottles and changed them into glass um, bottles, filled them with, with tap, filtered tap water, put a fancy label on them and made it into looking like a real premium product too. At Wild Adventures Melbourne, we give all of our guests a eco pack at the start of the day, which they hand back at the end of the day. That eco pack contains a reusable bottle, a reusable cup, um, and they use that throughout the day, which eliminates their need to have to go and buy a plastic bottle of water or buy a disposable coffee cup. We even provide them a free reef safe sunscreen, which eliminates their need to be wearing a sunscreen, which may be toxic to themselves and toxic to the ocean as well. So even looking at what experience you deliver and um, how your customers are going to interact with your destination and how you can eliminate the need for any negative impacts from that could be a reef safe sunscreen as an example. Reducing, um, introducing a waste reduction program um, is a really great way to do that. In, engage with your staff by appointing coordinators to identify some quick wins to get you started. There's some great examples out there. Beach Coma Holiday Park in New South Wales. Their guests um, can compost their food scraps and they have lots of different initiatives there, but they just make it really easy for their guests to reduce their waste. Peninsula Hot Springs here on the Mornington Peninsula, they built a food bowl, which they're growing their produce on site to, you know, uh, grow produce on site for their, their kitchens. Um, and then they're using the waste from their, their restaurant outlets to uh, create compost to then fertilize that food bowl. Um, they even run tours and events and workshops in that food bowl too as well. So um, just an, a, a way that they're reducing their food waste. Wildlife Coast Cruises um, down in Gippsland and Phillip Island, they have a green waste system developed where their food scraps from their onboard meal, more, meals go out to the chooks as well. So they're kind of reducing their, their food waste um, by doing that. Reusing um, and giving your customers the opportunity to be used is, is really, really important as well. So uh, Mona in Tasmania have a crockery collection station as well as food waste buckets to collect food scraps. So they've got a crockery collection station so that guests can reuse and refill their, their packs, uh, their cups up that they're using. Grand Way cheeses in Tasmania do some incredible ways to reduce their waste. For example, uh, they use the sheep's wool um, and they freeze it and they use that as insulation for their cheeses, which they send out to customers that have bought them online. They found that that sh frozen sheep's wool is actually 36 hours more effective than polystyrene. Um, they even have produced a vodka from the sheep way, um, a sheep way vodka made from the byproduct that would usually go to waste. So looking at your business and looking at potentially the, the waste that it produces, is there anything that could be made from that? Is there any way that that just doesn't go straight to waste? Um, so considering that is a really um, good option. Even considering buying secondhand or repairing items rather than purchasing new products, what can you reuse across your business so it doesn't come to the end of its life um, and is still safe to use um, is a really good option. Or can you even sell items that are being used so they get reused from, a, from another home? And recycling as well. So making it really, really easy for guests. Um, this is an example from Zoos Victoria. And I'm sure a lot of people on this call have visitors from a lot of countries around the world who may speak lots of different languages and uh, may have different rules on different recycling as well. Zoos Victoria have just made it really easy by labeling their bins in a clear way with different examples and visuals as well. So even for visitors coming that, that potentially don't speak English, they can still understand how to dispose of their rubbish um, correctly and how to recycle responsibly, which improves the correct bin usage and reduces cross-contamination as well. So providing separate bins uh, for bottles and cans, paper, coffee pods, coffee cups and other streams, 
and educating your team about what can be recycled. That can differ council to council, so just providing that information to both your staff and your guests is a really good option. Even incentivizing action, providing a, an award or reward for the team member making the biggest impact. So you may have heard of the four R's, reduce, reuse, refuse, recycle, but let's think about the nine R's from there. And this is about reducing your waste further. So refurbish, repair, repurpose, regift, and rethink. Climate change is, is not a future problem. It is here now, and the effects are being felt worldwide. And no doubt many of your businesses or family or friends have been impacted by floods, storms, bushfires, droughts. So the steps you can take to improve the resilience uh, of your business to climate change and to prepare and manage your risk. On page 25 of the toolkit, it contains information on, on how to do this. And there are steps you can take to improve the resilience of your business to climate change. So rehearse, maintain and review. So preventing, the first stage in disaster management is your prevention. This means understanding the risks your business faces and taking action to reduce that, that risk. Um, so conducting a, a risk assessment would be a good way of doing this. Preparing, the next stage is to prepare your disaster management team um, and plan and communicate that. Responding, have you planned, have you a planned response for evacuation? Um, response and pivoting your business to new circumstances that are going, going on. And then recover, getting back on your feet, having a recovery plan can help you, your business get back on its feet more efficiently. More efficiently. You might want to pre-plan some changes to your business that will help you build back better. And there's a don't, don't risk it manual in the toolkit that you can use. And this is a highly practical resource. So sorry, there's a link to this in the toolkit and Beck will be putting a link in the chat box for this. And this takes you through the steps to prevent, prepare, respond and recover from disaster situations. What I love about what this link goes through to in this don't risk um, manual is it includes useful case study videos about actual incidents from actual operators around Australia um, and how they dealt with those different ones as well. So a really important step to take. Your responsibility to help the planet does not stop with reducing your greenhouse gas emissions. You should also actively help conserve and restore biodiversity and natural ecosystems. Even the smallest business can do its bit to help support biodiversity and regeneration um, and improve air quality too. Here's some examples. So supporting biodiversity and regeneration, this can include planting um, native plants and trees, creating habitats and corridors for wildlife, reducing light and noise pollution, reviewing your chemical usage, organizing volunteer days, that could be for your teams, even for your customers um, to, to get involved, and educating staff and visitors. Diamond Waters Treehouse Retreat in New South Wales does some absolutely amazing things, and they have regenerated mangroves and forests around their property for over two decades. On their website, they've got some great before and after examples of how they've actually done that. So are you on a property? Are you somewhere where you can really support biodiversity and regeneration? Even if you're a tour operator like the business I own, where locally can you support? How can you support the things that your customers are enjoying and how you can you help your, your destination thrive ultimately? Is there a way of uh, your customers getting involved on citizen science? So Passions of Paradise, an operator up in Queensland, have the Coral Nurture Programme. They have a citizen science reef excursion where visitors can participate and learn how they can be involved in conservation and contribute. The Passions of Paradise have won um, national sustainability awards based on this amazing work that they've done and uh, gives a great way visitors really like to participate and feel like they're giving back as well and citizen science can be a really great way that they're doing that. Another example is on Kangaroo Island who have their Passport to Recovery Citizen Science Initiative where visitors on the island can kind of pick up a passport for citizen science and then uh, take part themselves and get involved. So a great way for them to connect with the destination. Wildlife engagement allows visitors to witness animals in the wild and learn about their habitats, environment and threats. 
it's important wildlife interactions, whether planned or not, follow responsible practices. So Tourism Australia have a guide of how to experience wildlife responsibly. And there's a link in the toolkit to this guide. It has eight tips on viewing wildlife responsibly, such as giving the animals space, resisting the urge to touch, um, be, being kind to nocturnal animals. So consider sharing links and resources like that via your, your website, your social channels, even in person, um, and even to your staff as well to help educate your visitors on doing the right thing and uh, being a responsible visitor when it comes to wildlife. Talking of visitor behaviour, while tourism businesses can make changes to become more sustainable, a collaborative effort is required. This means visitors must also think about their activities and choices while traveling. So how can you help shape visitor behavior? One of the ways you can do that is by leading by example. That can be through your sustainability reporting, goal setting, and visible actions will show your values and commitments. This will help visitors think about their consumption and make better choices. Also leading by example can help attract visitors and customers to book your product. Use different communications to do so, um, signage around your property of, of good practices, of good, good behaviour, even re rewarding good behaviour and incentivising it. Because in reality, not all visitors are going to be a, a conscious traveller, but we can at least give indications or incentives for them to act more responsibly. So looking at that is, is a great way of doing it. An example is Crystal Creek Meadows, an accommodation in Kangaroo Valley in New South Wales who on their website, they actually have um, a section encouraging guests um, before they've even visited of how they can get involved to um, prevent waste, how to compost, how to take public transport, how they can get involved in tree planting, how they can support the community. They're communicating and planting that seed of positive action from the visitor before, during um, and during their visit too. And this flows down from there. How can you help on their website? So it can be a really great way of, of the customer um, doing that and, and tackling those different areas too. We've mentioned a few times about rewarding conscious behavior, and that can be a really good option. That could be a value add or discount. That could be complimentary items. That could be reward points. There's lots of different ways operators across Australia are doing it. Could even just be something as simple as a thank you card to acknowledge customer behavior. Crystal Brook Hotels, which is a, a luxury hotel chain in New South Wales and Queensland, their tagline is responsible luxury. And they have something called a footprint free stay where their visitors can uh, choose to not have their room made up. And in exchange, they are rewarded with a voucher to use at the cafe and bar, the restaurant and bar downstairs. So that alleviates pressure on the cleaning team, environmental costs of cleaning that linen and towels. It also um, encourages the customer to go down and spend more money down in the bar and restaurant. So it's a great way of incentivizing that at the same time driving traffic to one of their outlets. On the Mornington Peninsula, there's a cafe and restaurant here called The Kitchen. They've got a real simple um, sign outside their venue where if you fill up a bag of rubbish from the foreshore, you'll get a free coffee. So just, uh, you know, really planting that seed of if you take responsible action, we're going to reward you for it and we're going to incentivize you for it as well. So um, just some food for thought of some examples of how that can happen. So let's look um, at your next steps and how you can take action in your business. So using the toolkit chapter two tips to review your waste, transport, visitor behaviors, biodiversity and regeneration and air quality. Use the first steps and next steps checklists in chapter two of the toolkit to help you guide, budget and prioritize your actions. Set goals for energy and water usage, waste, biodiversity and regeneration, carbon emissions for your business to set short and longer term goals to help you reduce those areas. And then watch, if you haven't already, webinar one for a recap on creating your own action plan. So I'm going to turn my camera back on now and we do have a question for you based on the webinar that we've been chatting about today. So um, Beck, is there any, we're going to put some questions on there of what's one idea from the webinar that you can apply in your business in the short term today. So think about those 
those quick wins. Think about those things that you can implement straight away across those different sections that we talked about um, and what might work in your business and pop them down in the chat box and um, Beck will share some of them as they come through. Thank you, Nick. And while they do, I think Nick's shared a number of really fantastic case studies of different business types from around Australia. So yeah, even um, the really small wins, I'd love to hear about just one thing that you take away from today. And uh, as Nick mentioned, even the water, the water saving one in my own personal house has been a, a big one um, with teenage children. But again, um, in our business at Tourism Collective, um, one of the big ones we've brought in this year is very much our own uh, procurement policy. So looking about, you know, when we, we travel a lot for work, so looking at making sure we're choosing those businesses that are already doing a lot to reduce their um, water waste and energy emissions. Um, we've got one that's just come through. Um, we've got a question here. Um, so Kylie has just shared that they're looking to, one action is gonna be green, looking at their um, energy contracts. So looking to change over to more green sourcing of power, which is fantastic. Um, and also looking at some of those water saving tips. So thank you, Kylie. That, um, can, be a really, that can be a really good one, Beck, for um, you know reviewing all utility providers across you. So that could be your, your bank and seeing if that bank, for example, invests in the fossil fuel industry. That could be your internet provider. That could be, as you mentioned, your energy provider. Um, looking at all areas. I mean, I even go as deep as looking at who our super is with and who our insurance is with for the business and lots of areas too. So assessing that supply chain and looking at who those providers are and finding the most ethical option that suits your business um, budgets and, and what suits your business um, is, is a great way to do things. Great. I've um, got lots coming through now, which is great. Um, there's another good one here actually from Beck. So she lives rurally and she's um, made the point that they don't have access to green waste disposal. And we absolutely hear that from a lot of um, regional and remote businesses. But she did say they're looking to install compost bin and being more active with categorising their waste. So great job there, Beck. Um, there's another one here, um, giving guests daily eco packs from Bonnie. So I think it's probably a bit of inspiration from you there, Nick. Um, another one is, uh, looking to have a cafe voucher ideas to help guests participate in uh, environment initiatives from Matt. So thank you. There's quite a few more there coming through. So I think you guys can all see them there as well. Um, so Nick, I'll hand back to you for the next uh, screen, which is more general questions. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, waste management in different areas of Australia is is, is a common um, challenge that we've seen of, of, of those waste, you know, challenges of what can be recycled and what's getting collected and distances and all that sort of thing as well. And that can be a real, a real challenge as well. And, um, you know, sometimes opportunities arise here in Victoria, the container deposit scheme only came in uh, November last year. And I use that container deposit scheme as an, as an opportunity from all those cans and bottles that we were collecting from nature to then uh, using that. And there's codes that we could type in to then donate to local, um, conservation charities and things as well. So, um, you know, sometimes uh, waste is, is a real challenge and there might not be the perfect answer right now, but when there's opportunities that come through with, that can you can potentially add on an action to increase your positive impact, it can be uh, well worth looking at too. So um, we're gonna um, head to a, a Q&A now. And um, yeah, any questions that come through that Beck and I can help answer, um, yeah, feel free to, to fire them through um, or yeah, Beck, let us know if there's any coming from that. Okay, I was just gonna say, there's a good question here um, from Sochia um, who asks, what are the practical solutions to encourage sustainable tourism supply chain? So that's a big question, um, but what have you got your thoughts around that on really helping those suppliers that you work with to become more sustainable, which is I think what Sochia is asking. Yeah, I think I think there's two ways of looking at it. It's one going out there and, and seeking that conscious supply chain. So seeking providers in your supply chain that provide an ethical product. Um, you know, for example, 1% for the planet members are businesses that have committed to donating 1% of their revenue each year to environmental and social causes. So they've got uh, some sort of purpose from there as well. Uh, there's directories for B Corps as another example as well. So B Corps are businesses around the world um, that have met some of the highest standards of environmental and social performance, transpa transparency and accountability. Um, but it's actually going out and asking your, your current supply chain if it's gonna be very challenging to change that and asking what they're doing and putting those open questions out there. What are you doing to decarbonize? Are you 
utilizing renewable energy um you know what what options are you how's your manufacturing uh, supply chain is that being sort of measured and is that ethical too um and asking those questions out there and ultimately if it doesn't um align with your values and doesn't align with what you're looking to do as a as a business then it is worth considering other options i'm a big believer that there's an alternative or a solution to just about everything as well so um for, for wham for the business i run i look for a supplier locally within victoria if i can't find that then i'll look within australia as well and make sure that they have those um places in place to have for example uh, an ethical and responsible manufacturing um target so that i can ensure that that product is a uh, the, the best uh, product that I'm using across my supply chain as well. So it's asking the question, reviewing, but potentially finding um, a, a, another option that might be a more um, ethical and purpose-driven business option. Cool, thank you, Nick. I've got a few more coming through, which is great. Thank you, everyone. There's another good question here um, from Sarah. So Sarah asks, has she got any other suggestions for alternatives to use gas for hot water? And I know, again, this is a, this is a good one and there's probably lots of different solutions. So any thoughts or feedback on that one, Nick? Uh, yeah, I mean, United Places, um, you know, use use solar for their thermal to, to heat their water and things as well. So again, reducing their reliance on, um, on gas and things as well. So yeah, I mean, there's obviously a lot of properties now that kind of are, you know, transitioning to, to not use, use gas in them and things, but, um, it, that can be a complicated one of, of coming out there. So there's there's no perfect answer to that if there's a heavy reliance currently in your business, but there may be some options out there through um, building or uh, yeah, different different using renewable energy to, to help uh, heat things that previously was used for gas. <laughs> and um, it's a good point too, because there are also, depending on your states and territories and also national level, there are grants that do come out to help um, with energy to energy transition, um, particularly for electrifying appliances. So again, electrifying, shifting from gas to electric, yep. electric um, heating um, is you know, one way obviously to reduce emissions from gas as well. Um, also, I think that's, I'm just having a look here. Do do, just having a look through. I think most of the others we've probably sort of generally covered as well. Um, so Nick, I think I might hand back to you just for that last little bit. Um, I will also just remind everyone, so we do have a lot of people live today and which is fantastic. We've got a number of our industry partners in the room as well. So um, if you haven't already, we'd love you to promote the final two webinars as well. Um, so I'll hand back to you as well, Nick. Thanks, Beck. So we thank you very much for those great questions and great little um, goals that you're setting yourselves as your business. And that's what it's all about. It's all about progress, not perfection. It's all about selling yourself um, short term and longer term goals, selling yourselves things that you can change tomorrow to improve your uh, environmental and, and climate action. Um, and then things that, that might happen in the future as well um, that, that might be a longer term goal, such as getting electric vehicles in your fleet or, or something like that. So we're going to ask this question again. The QR code is on your screen of um, after attending today's webinar, how confident do you now feel in using the toolkit to take environmental and climate action in your business? And Beck, if you could just update as those are coming through, that would be wonderful. So looking a um, lot more confident and lots, a lot of people who are significantly more confident, which is really good. Um, I've also just put the link in the um, question box as well. So if that's easier for you to complete the poll that way, um, we'll just leave that open for a few more minutes, Nick. But um, yes, definitely more confident, which is fantastic. Beautiful. Okay, so the next webinar is on the 9th of May. We That is uh, webinar three, and that is chapter three of the toolkit, Respecting Culture. Such a crucial um, area to, to look at and take action in. Um, and we're gonna be providing some amazing tips and examples and case studies across Australia that are doing some great things as well. We highly encourage you to join live so you can interact with the chat, get those links um, that Beck's been putting through as well, and then also um, ask any questions that you may have, but it will also be recorded as well. So Thursday 9th of May, 
um, 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, Australian Eastern Standard Time. So uh, yeah, we really, really hope you make it. And if you can help, as Beck says, share this with uh, colleagues and uh, friends and things as well, that would be wonderful. Um, so people can know about this toolkit because it's an amazing resource to do and um, super valuable for businesses, small and big as well. So we really look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. This has been webinar two, environmental and climate action. Um, please reach out if you have any questions, but we wish you all the best and look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.